Oh, mothers and human beings, limitless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, obstruct us, who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and all-knowingness. May they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly. Establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious body. All mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and all knowing. May they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious body. All mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me. Obstructors who harm me and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and all knowingness, may they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious body. Thus, until I achieve Buddha, I engage in virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. And from now until <clears throat> until death, I engage in virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I engage in virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. In the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until body is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all wandering beings in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until body is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all wandering beings. In the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until Bodhi is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all wandering beings. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from the bias of attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from the bias of attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from the bias of attachment and aversion.
Now please turn to the Buddha Shakyamuni Sadhana. In Sanskrit, Arya Buddha Anushmriti, in English, recollection of the noble Buddha, homage to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In this way, the Bhagavan Buddha is the Tathagata, the full destroyer, the perfect and complete Buddha, the one who possesses awareness and the grounds, the Sugata, the knower of the worlds, the turner of the wheel, the tames beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of all gods and men, the Buddha, the Bhagavan, such the Tagatas are concordant with meritorious causes. Their roots of virtues not wasted and are wearing the beauty of patience. They are treasure grounds of the merits and are adorned with the minor marks. The flowers of their major marks have bloomed and their activities are precise and appropriate. Nothing unpleasant upon seeing them, and they deeply admire those who devote faithfully their intelligence is unsurpassed and they are indomitable in terms of their powers. They are teachers of all sentient beings, fathers of all bodhisattvas, kings of all noble beings, guides for those who travel to the city of Nirvana with unfathomable Wisdom and inconceivable courage, they have absolutely pure speeches, pleasant melodies, enchanting faces, and incomparable bodies. They are unsolid by the desire realm, absolutely unsolid by the form realm, and untouched by the formless realm. Completely free from the aggregates, free of the constituents and with the sense fields restrained. Having completely cut the knots, they are totally free from the agonies, utterly free from craving. They have crossed over the rivers and their wisdom is absolutely perfect. They abide within the wisdom of the Bhagavan Buddhas of past, future, and present. They do not abide in Nirvana and instead abide at the limits of perfect reality and sit on the stage from where they look upon all sentient beings. These are the great qualities of the Tathagata's perfect wisdom and of remembering the Noble Buddha. In Sanskrit, Dharma Anusmirti, recollection of the Dharma, homage to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The sublime Dharma is perfectly delivered. It is the practice of chastity. It is virtuous in the beginning, virtuous in the middle and virtuous at the end, perfect in meaning, perfect in words, uncorrupted, totally thorough, totally pure, totally impeccable. It is the Vinaya Dharma, well taught by the Bhagavan Buddha. It is perfectly discovered, free from melodies, free from interruptions. Well aimed, meaningful to behold and to be seen by the wise individually on their own. It is the perfectly taught Vinaya Dharma, which paves the way for complete awakening for the renunciates. It is free from inconsistency and endowed with consistency. It is endowed with a foundation and the perpetual path has ceased in it and of remembering Dharma. In Sanskrit, Sangha Anushmriti, in English, recollection of the Sangha, homage to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. 
The noble sanghas are those who proceed with propriety, proceed with appropriacy, proceed with conformity, proceed with honesty. They are worthy of offering prostrations to and worthy of putting the palms together for. They are great beings with complete mastery of the qualities who purify the gifts of offerings completely. They are worthy of generosity, worthy of generosity by all and of remembering the Sangha. The qualities of Buddha are inconceivable. The sublime Dharma is likewise inconceivable. The noble Sangha is unconce inconceivable. When one has faith in the inconceivable, its ripening is also inconceivable. May I be born in the land of complete purity. Once again, the overall structure of this practice, the first part is uh, recollecting the qualities of the three jewels, uh, which are the objects of refuge for all those who have entered the path of Dharma. Uh, to enter the path of Dharma, to practice the Buddha Dharma, um, it is said that, you know, you could be doing meditation, you know, I think, uh, especially uh, in the West, uh, we tend to say, you know, oh, I meditate. Uh, because uh, understandably, that's easier to explain to other people what we do. Mm, but sometimes, you know, if we say that too much, yeah, then, then we might uh, uh, reinforce this confusion that, you know, the Buddha had given only uh, a one one like you know one solution to you know the problem of samsara oh i meditate and in fact what the buddha taught many ways to summarize what the buddha taught but essentially you could say the buddha taught a threefold approach a threefold approach to uh, the problem that is identified as samsara a cyclic existence, cyclic existence whereby we are turned around and around and around by the clashes, by the afflictive emotions. So this <clears throat> three-fold uh, approach uh, <clears throat> has the um, element, has the component of uh, disciplined conduct, has the um, uh, component of meditative concentration, and has the component of uh, clear seeing or wisdom, <clears throat> uh, shila, samadhi, and pranya. Mm, these are the three. So this in this threefold practice, mm, uh, these three elements uh, they mutually reinforce each other. Mm, conventionally, we say the starting point uh, is to uh, pay attention to disciplined conduct. Uh, the obvious aspects of disciplined conduct uh, is to avoid the ten non-virtues and to cultivate the ten virtues. And so along those lines, uh, there are various sets of uh, precepts uh, that we can take uh, to train. Uh, so beginning with the most basic, which is the five precepts uh, of uh, lay practitioners of Upasakas and Upasikas. Uh, these five lay precepts, they are said to be the ground and the foundation for all the other uh, precepts of training uh, that fall under uh, the individual liberation uh, precepts. And so the five precepts are the foundation for all of it. And the five are basically uh, not to kill, not to steal, 
not to commit uh, adultery or sexual misconduct, uh, not to uh, lie, not to deceive, and not to be intoxicated. So these are the five root precepts. Uh, so uh, if these are the five root precepts, uh, but really uh, they are the reference point for us to then cultivate avoiding the ten non-virtues, uh, which is a more detailed, uh, uh, more extensive um, reference point. Uh, and there in the ten non-virtues, uh, just to review in case, you know, some of us still, you know, a little fuzzy, uh, what are the ten non-virtues? And this is really important. It's not that, you know, we're trying to force anyone to memorize long lists of things. Uh, but if there is a list uh, that we should try uh, to know uh, and to remember, then knowing what are the causes of suffering and therefore knowing how to avoid them <clears throat> is fundamental to uh, practicing the Buddha Dharma. Uh, so three that pertains to uh, the non-virtues of physical actions is killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Uh, four that pertains to speech, mm, and these four that pertains to speech is uh, deceptive speech we avoid, uh, we give up, mm, destructive speech we give up, divisive speech we give up, and distracted speech we give up. Uh, this is not the usual translation, but I found this to be easy for me to remember the four Ds that we give up. Deceptive speech, destructive speech, divisive speech, and distracted speech. Then the last three that pertains to the mind is a coveting mind, uh, is a hateful, resentful mind, and then a confused mind with regards to um, especially uh, that of denying that there is cause, karmic causality denying that there is cause and effect, or being confused about how cause and effect plays out. So these are the ten non-virtues. Uh, so normally, uh, we begin by focusing on that first. But of course, you know, to the degree that we're able to stabilize, steady our heart uh, through meditative concentration, uh, through cultivating samadhi, then it's a lot easier to have the presence of mind to notice, ah, uh, it looks like, you know, one of these 10 non-virtues, opportunities to create one of these 10 non-virtues uh, is offering themselves uh, and knowing how to uh, not take the, uh, not bite the bait, so to say, uh, not to uh, go in that direction, but to navigate away. Uh, that comes from having uh, cultivated uh, samadhi. Samadhi here uh, is steadying the mind, steadying the heart. Mm. Mm, with that, mm, to be able to steady the heart, to steady the mind, uh, of course, uh, it's also uh, a lot easier to do that if we make effort in keeping our precepts, avoiding the ten non-virtues. Because if we don't do that, then it disturbs our peace. It disturbs our mind. It, it causes movements and even shakes, maybe even earthquakes in our mind. If our conduct is not disciplined, uh, the other point about disciplined conduct, so the obvious ones uh, are those uh, 10 non-virtues to avoid, five precepts to observe, uh, and all the way to the precepts of monks and nuns, which are the most extensive. I call those uh, the full coverage uh, insurance against suffering. Uh, sometimes we think, you know, oh, that is so detailed, so difficult. But like, uh, you know, you either have basic insurance or you have full coverage insurance. 
the monastic precepts offer full coverage insurance. Um, but that's the uh, under the monastic uh, full coverage insurance, mm, there are aspects of training yeah, that are not directly uh, or so obviously related to what you and I may identify as morality. Yeah. But instead, there are uh, precepts of training in the monastic context uh, that speaks to more about being disciplined. So the Buddha prescribed, you know, like uh, uh, mindful ways of eating, mindful ways of walking, mindful ways of sitting, mindful ways of settling uh, differences and disputes uh, within the monastic community. All those have to do with discipline. In the past, I have used the translation of moral ethics for Sheila. Uh, but I think uh, that term, that translation is maybe too limited. People think that it's just moral, morality, or ethical conduct. Yes, it covers uh, the areas of morality and ethical conduct, but it's more than that. It's also about being disciplined. And the Buddha prescribed uh, a set of uh, prohibitions, or prescriptions and proscriptions for uh, this purpose. So when we begin to uh, kind of use that uh, as a reference point uh, to train, it can also be used for training, uh, not just in the realm of avoiding the causes of suffering in the sense of the course, uh, the gross course causes of suffering, but also the subtle causes of suffering. And that then reinforce, right, the ability to uh, settle into samadhi, uh, to steady uh, ourselves into samadhi. Then when the mind is in the state of samadhi, then uh, wisdom can grow, uh, clear seeing can occur. Then clear seeing, you know, to the degree that clear seeing has now arisen, right, then it makes the practice of the precepts, the keeping of the precepts, uh, the uh, avoiding the ten non-virtues, more and more second nature. And so that you're no longer walking around, right? Uh, with a list in your head, oh, I can't do this, oh, I cannot do that, oh, be careful of this, oh, be, uh, be afraid of that. Uh, and, uh, and that is the result of having developed, established, uh, clear seeing, not confused seeing. And so when we have that, then it reinforces uh, our uh, practice of disciplined conduct. Then disciplined conduct uh, strengthens samadhi. Then samadhi uh, strengthens uh, prana, And prana strengthens shila, and on and on. So these are the threefold training. Anyway, coming back to structure of our practice, beginning with recollecting the virtues of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the objects of refuge. So we should, you know, not be shy to say, I mean, we don't need to announce to the world and and, and, and make a big deal, you know, and say, oh, I practice the Buddha Dharma, I practice the Buddha Dharma. But with yourself, you need to be clear, you know, I practice the Buddha Dharma. And not just, you know, the habit of like, oh, I meditate. I practice the Buddha Dharma. So with these three elements, then these three elements need the three refuges as the reference point. So think of it as, you know, these three are the methods, so to say, Shila, Samadhi, and Banya, and Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, reference point. And so that's the first part of this practice, the qualities of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And second uh, is to come into the presence of the Guru, uh, which is Buddha Shakamini, 
is the common guru for all practitioners of Buddha Dharma. So that's the second element. Then third, to make offerings to Guru Buddha Shah community through the seven branches of offerings. Then the next part, the fourth part is the recitation and the visualization involved in recitation of the mantra of Buddha Shah community. And remembering that one way to understand the uh, Muni Muni Mahamuni, uh, Mune Mune Mahamuni, uh, is Muni is uh, Muni means uh, the one who is silent. So that means it's calmed, uh, like the noise and the chaos of like a you know a big storm uh, in the ocean. Muni is someone who has calmed uh, the turbulence of these storms. So the first uh, Muni uh, calms uh, the uh, emotive obscurations, kleshas, obscuration of kleshas. The second Muni calms, uh, quiets uh, the uh, cognitive obscurations. And the Mahamuni is the uh, silencing uh, of the um, habitual tendencies, uh, obscurations of habitual tendencies, uh, the most kind of pernicious in some ways, uh, because they're, they're so subtle, uh, but they're so powerful. And they run deep uh, and they run strong, uh, reinforcing our negative habit patterns. So to silence the third as well. So this is the visualization and recitation of mantra. Then after that followed by the next section, which is uh, the praise section. After the praise session is the dissolution and the mindfulness of breath meditation section. And following that, it's making aspirations and dedication. So these are the main parts of this sadhana. Now, uh, page 13, beginning with uh, the second part, coming into the presence of Buddha Shakyamuni, coming into the presence of our root guru. If it is hard to uh, transform uh, the space that you are in now uh, into this pure land, uh, and at the center of the Pure Land is Buddha Shakyamuni, then as a skillful means, as a method, you can imagine transporting yourself uh, to Buddha Shakyamuni's Pure Land, which is said to be uh, in this uh, place called Voucher Peaks. Uh, Voucher's Peak uh, in uh, India. Uh, obviously not speaking of you know, the literal space of Voucher's Peak, uh, but a dimension of the vouchers peak uh, where the Buddha uh, said that he will continue to teach the Dharma at vouchers peak uh, even after his physical body has dissolved uh, at the age of 80 in Kushinagara when he achieved Mahapari Nirvana. Uh, in the Lotus Sutra, he says, you know, for those who know how to see, uh, then they can see that he has never left vouchers peak. He has never stopped turning the wheel of Dharma on Vulture's Peak. So then you can think, ah, I have been transported to Vulture's Peak and I am now in the presence of Buddha Shakyamuni. Om Bhajra Amrita Kundali Hana Hana Hong Pe Om Swabha Vashuddha Sarva Dharma Swabha Vashuddha Hang 
From the state of emptiness arises a wheel of protection. In the center of that is a throne that is held above by powerful men and lions. Upon that, on a seat made of lotus, moon, and sun, is a mum syllable in golden color, which completely transforms into the teacher Shakya Raja, who radiates. Golden rays like refined gold. He is ornamented with the thirty-two major marks and eighty minor marks. His right hand is in the earth, touching gesture, and the left is in the gesture of equipoise. He sits with his two legs in the vajra posture. Wearing the three dharma robes in saffron color, like the clouds of sunrise, he is as magnificent as a hundred thousand suns. And in the pores of his body, there are the one thousand and two buddhas of the fortunate yon, who appear clearly yet are without substance. I'll take a few minutes, a few moments to feel yourself to be in the presence of Guru Buddha Shakyamuni. Requesting and asking Buddha Shakyamuni to be our Guru, to be our preceptor, to be our guide. To please show us the way, the way to become like him. To actualize what he actualized, to have the activities that he had, to be able to benefit beings the way he is benefiting beings. Or as to say to Buddha Shakyamuni, may I come to you and may I become like you. Now on page 15, we make the seven branches of offering. The seven branches, uh, or the seven elements, uh, the first is to pay homage, the second is to make offerings, the third is to review, uh, to confess and review all our non-virtuous actions and patterns of behavior, uh, and make a commitment to relinquish them. Uh, and the fourth is to rejoice uh, in the virtue and the merit uh, of all beings, from the sublime beings and down to any good that we see others doing, we rejoice in that. Uh, and the fifth uh, is to uh, request uh, the Buddhas to turn the wheel of Dharma, uh, to request the teachers to teach the Dharma to benefit us, to benefit beings. Uh, the sixth is to request Buddhas not to uh, leave this world, not to give up on us, but to remain. And then the seventh is to dedicate merit, dedicate all the good that we're doing, dedicate what we do, our practice to the awakening, the enlightenment of all beings. This dedicating of uh, merit, you know, it sounds uh, sometimes uh, often, you know, it just ends up being kind of like a ritual at the end. You know, oh, we have to dedicate, we have to dedicate, we have to dedicate. Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes it acquires a certain magical quality, you know, like, oh, I dedicate this for this person, this person, this person, uh, to make this person feel better, to make this person, uh, often like when people have a hard time, people are suffering, of course, we think of them, we pray for them. Uh, 
Yes, I'm not saying don't do that, but we also cannot forget the main point of this dedication of merit. The main point of this dedication of merit in some ways is to serve as a reminder for us. At the very least, maybe I should put it that way, at the very least, you know, when we do dedication of merit, at the conclusion of any formal practice, at the very least, you know, it should function as a reminder that we don't practice the Buddha Dharma in a very limited way. I think, understandably, uh, we tend to do that. I tend to do that. So I will only practice the Dharma for my own relaxation, for my own peace of mind, for my own not getting stress. Big word these days, you know, getting stressed for my own mental health, for my own... And it tends to be like that, you know. Now, the problem with that is not that the Buddha says, you know, you should not take care of yourself. In fact, Buddha is a big advocate, I would say, of taking care of ourselves. But the problem is we, in the context of taking care of ourselves, often end up feeding that very set of patterns that will continue to cause and reinforce our unhappiness. When we turn Dharma practice into merely just taking care of myself. So when a little bit goes wrong, you know, we tend to give up. Especially in the context of practicing with others. Some things go wrong. Of course, it's never just one thing, right? There are other things going on in our lives. But then if we relate to Dharma practice in a very tight and narrow way, for a short while, it, it seems like, oh, I'm such a good practitioner. I feel so good. I'm with these people. Oh, everything here feels good. But then when slightly something goes wrong, you know, and then immediately you know, all our patterns that we've been working on dispelling you know, comes right back in. And then we even can explain it in Dharma terms and say, no, this is wrong, I need to, this, that, all that, you know, they are not fair to me, this, this, that, then all goes down the drain. When we do dedication of merit at the end of our practice, you know, it's a powerful reminder. What is this really for? This is for Big picture, big, big picture. And for this big, 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 big picture, you know, do not be moved so easily by shifting conditions. Do not be moved so easily by difficulties. Do not be moved so easily when things go right as well. Do not be moved so easily because we are committed, as we say, with bodhicitta, we are committed to the big picture. And when we have the big picture, then all the difficulties and challenges of various types, sometimes this challenge could simply be someone saying something to us at the wrong time. Then we are triggered. And if we keep getting triggered, we will never be free. We will never be free. If we don't know how to turn it around, as they say in the Zen Chinese tradition, they say, turn the light around. Turn that light around and shine it on our own minds. If we don't know how to do that, 
then Dharma practice is just for mundane purposes and you will be disappointed in the end. Don't do that. Don't waste your time like this, you know. So this dedication at the end is a powerful way to help us remember. Don't do that. Not don't do that because Buddha says don't do. But don't do that because you're wasting your time. You're just walking around and around and around and around in the Dharma center, so to say. And feeling good about, you know, as long as everything goes well. Don't do that. Whether it's Dharma Center, Dharma Center is just kind of a way to speak about, like, seemingly surrounding yourself with Dharma. It could be your own house, you know. It could be you never go to any Dharma Center, which is, you know, for some of us, that's our situation, you know. Well, and then that's our situation, you know, like within our own house, you know. Just walking around and around and around and thinking, oh, I have the Dharma, I have the Dharma. So meaning our comfort zone. And then sometimes, you know, Dharma practitioners, their comfort zone becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Then you're wasting your time. To each and every one of the lions among humans who move in the three times in the walls of ten directions, I pay homage to them all with my body, speech, and sincere mind by the power of their aspirations to engage in Perfect conduct, all conquerors are vividly present in the direct vision of my mind with bodies as numerous as atoms in the world. I bow completely to all conquerors on one atom of Buddhas as numerous as all atoms, each amidst a host of bodhisattvas, and I visualize that the expanse of all phenomena is completely filled with conquerors in this way through an infinite ocean of praise for you vocalized in an ocean of mirrored melodies i shall tell of the qualities of you conquerors and praise all of you sugatas superior flowers and superior garlands musical instruments ointments and grand parasols grand oil lamps and superior Incense, I offer them to you, conquerors, splendid costumes and ambrosia scents, heaps of incense powder as high as Mount Meru and the most excellent of all marvelous arrays. I offer them to you, conquerors. Offerings that are unsurpassed and vast are also directed to all you conquerors through the power of faith in Perfect conduct, I pray homage to you, conquerors, and make offerings, whatever non-virtues I have committed with my body, speech, and mind, influenced by attachment, anger, and ignorance. I confess each and every one. I rejoice in the merit of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions of Solitary Realizers of here is still in training and those beyond and all of all migratory beings. You who are lambs of the worlds of the Ten Directions who have attained the desireless state of Buddhahood through the stages of awakening, I beseech all you lords of beings to turn the supreme will of Dharma with my palms put together, I pray those of you who intend to enter Parinirvana, please stay for the happiness and well-being of all migratory beings, for eons as numerous as atoms of the earth. The small amount of virtue that I have accumulated by paying homage, offering, confessing, 
rejoicing, beseeching, and praying, I dedicate all of it for the sake of awakening. Generated in front is Munindra, the lord of the dharma. In his heart is a mum syllable of golden color, surrounded by a muni mantra placed clockwise. From that rays of light radiate, making offerings to all conquerors and their children. Return and illuminate on all sentient beings in the six realms thereby freeing them from their sufferings and purifying their karmic obscurations. Then the light dissolves into the mantra in the heart of the front generation. Once again, the rays of light radiate, allowing the blessing to penetrate my mind and purify the two obscurations and establishing me in the state of unsurpassed awakening. When it says two obscurations, then it's referring to the main two, which is the emotive obscurations and the cognitive. When we say three obscurations, then we are further highlighting that for both of these, you know, the emotive and the cognitive, uh, there is a subtle form of that, which is the karmic propensities, the karmic patterns that have been established. As we continue to feed uh, these emotional or emotive obscurations and cognitive obscurations, uh, then uh, we also reinforce uh, the habits the habit patterns related to these. So then that makes it into the three obscurations. And sometimes when you come across the list of four obscurations, then they are referring to the fourth one, which is the grosser aspect of, whereas the habitual obscurations are the very subtle aspects of the two obscurations, emotive and cognitive, Karmic, in a way you could say, is the manifested and the obvious aspects of the emotive and cognitive. Those are karmic obscurations. And so when you have four, when they say four obscurations, which is not so common, they said, but if you come across that, that's what it's referring to. Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Yaswaha 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 Om Mune Mune Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Yaswaha 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 
Um, one name on the mom on the Om mone mone maha monaya so ha At the time of your birth, chief of two legged beings, you took seven steps on this great earth and declared, I am the most excellent one in this world. I pay homage to you who even then were wise. You first descended from Tushita heaven and entered your mother's womb at Rajagriha, sage born in the garden of Lumbini, Bhagavan, God of Gods. I pay homage to you. In the celestial mansion, you were served by eight and four nursemaids in the city of Shakya. You enjoy the pleasures of youth in the land of Kapilavas too. Mary Gopa, one with <clears throat> and the three wolves, I pay homage to you after the displays of sadness at the four entrances to the city. You shave off your hair in front of the stupa of absolute purity and practice asceticism on the banks of Nairanja River, or one free from the defects of the two obscurations. I pay homage to you, you subdue a mad elephant in Rajagriha. Among the monkeys of Vaishali offered you honey, sage truly awakened at Magadha. One he illuminates with the light of insight and wisdom. I pay homage to you. You turn the wheel of Dharma and Varanasi, perform great miracles at Jetavana, and attain Pari Nirvana and Kushinagara, one whose heart is profound as space. I pay homage to you. Thus is the Bhagavan, the Lord of the Dharma. By the virtue of this brief praise of your deeds, may the actions of all beings also become like your deeds, Sugata. Tathagata, may I and all beings become just like you with the body, retinue, lifespan, Buddha field, an excellent name like yours. By the power of praising and supplicating you, may sickness, evil spirits, poverty, and conflict be pacified whenever I and the rest live, and may you make the dharma and auspiciousness proliferate. May teachers come to the world and the teaching shine like the rays of the sun, may holders of the teachings Disciples, discourses, and practice flourish, and may there be the auspiciousness of the teachings remaining here for a long time.
The front generated Bhagavan, the Lord of the Dharma, melts into light and dissolves into the Muni Mantra circle, which then dissolves into the Mum syllable. As the Mum syllable dissolves into the spot between my eyebrows, my body, speech, and mind become inseparable from the body, speech, and mind of the conqueror. So the, your guru now dissolves into light and enters into your body. In that instant, you yourself appear in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni, inseparable from your guru. Then if you are able to, uh, maintaining this divine pride of being the guru of being Buddha Shakyamuni. Practice mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of in breath, mindfulness of out breath.
Now making the aspiration prayers and dedication at the end. Page 27. I pay homage to all the Buddhas, I pay homage to the Bodhisattva Rishis who possesses divine eyes as well as to the hearers. I pay homage to Bodhicitta which precludes all bad realms and shows the path to the higher realms thereby guiding one to the state without aging and death whatever evil deeds i have done under the domination of my mind i approach the buddhas and confess them all i have accumulated a collection of merit through the three types of actions through the seed of omniscience i have may i attain the inexhaustible awakening in the pure lands of the ten directions, whatever offerings are made in which the enlightened Buddhas rejoice, I too rejoice in them. I confess all evil deeds and rejoice in all meritorious deeds. I pay homage to all Buddhas. May I attain the supreme wisdom. I request the Bodhisattvas dwelling on the tenth stage in all quarters of the ten directions to awaken into supreme awakening. Having awakened into supreme awakening and defeated the Maras and their army, may you turn the wheel of Dharma for the welfare of all living beings. Through the sound of the great drum of Dharma, may sentient beings become liberated from their sufferings. For limitless billions of eons, may you continue to give Dharma teachings. May the excellent ones from among two legged beings take care of me as I am sunk in the mud of desire, bound with the tight robe of existence and trapped by all kinds of fetters. You, Buddhas, do not despise those whose minds make them impure. You have the heart of loving kindness. For all sentient beings, may you free them from the ocean of existence. Following in the footsteps of the completely awakened Buddhas who are present, those of the past and those who are yet to come, may I engage in Bodhisattva activities, having completed the four six perfections, may I liberate the sentient beings of the six realms. Having actualized the six super knowledges, may I reach the unsurpassable awakening. May I realize the Dharma of emptiness, wherein there is no arising, no occurring, no nature, no abode, no mental cognition, and no entities. Like Buddha, the great Rishi, may I realize the Buddha-dharma, wherein there is no sentient being, no life force, no person, no reviving, and no self. Without resorting to self-fixation and the things fixated upon as mine, may I have no stinginess and give gifts for the welfare of all sentient beings. As things do not exist, as things may my pleasures be spontaneously present, as all things fall apart, may I complete the perfection of generosity and erring in the prescribed moral ethics, may I possess utterly pure moral ethics with morality devoid of conceit, may I complete the perfection of moral ethics. Just like the earth, water, fire, or wind, may I not dwell in anger and with patience be free from anger. May I complete the perfection of patience. Through the effort of initiating effort, may I have perpetual joy without laziness and with powerful body and mind, may I complete the perfection of effort. Through the illusion like equipoise, the sage progress, the brave progression equipoise, and the diamond like equipoise, may I complete the perfection of meditative concentration. 
through the three doors of complete liberation, the sameness of the three times, and the actualization of the three full knowledge, may I complete the perfection of excellent wisdom with words of praise from all the Buddhas, with brilliant light and blazing magnificence, and through my efforts to do as the Bodhisattvas do, may my aspirations be fulfilled. Through my having engaged in such activities, may my loving kindness become renowned, and may I thus complete the six perfections and abide fully at the culmination of the ten stages. Chang Chu Sam Chu Rim Po Chi Ma Ge Ba Nam Ge Gu Chi Ge Ba Nyam Pa Me Pa Yang O ne gong du be Okay, we are done today. Uh, a reminder uh, in our usual uh, weekday uh, practice. Uh, we don't meet Saturday, Sunday, but for the Sakadawa practice, we do meet uh, tomorrow. Mm. And uh, on Sunday uh, as well. Uh, oh, wait. Yes, we do meet tomorrow and Sunday as well. Uh, and then, you know, continuing on to next week. Okay.